exactly what I just showed. Um, you know, instead of querying actual databases, I just have some mock data. Um, so my you know, URL to Twitter's DB is just a hash map with some dummy data, and then I have another map from Twitter I need to follow right day, uh, which is just another hash map with some dummy data. Um, okay, so now I'm going to create my topology and submit it to the cluster. So I'm do that. Okay, so that's the topology starting up. And it finished starting up, and it's not doing anything because um, there's no request, so it's just sitting, waiting for um, function indications. Okay, but now I can call methods on my DRBC server. So here I'm saying, call the execute method. I want to execute the reach function, and here's the argument I'm getting. So it's this, some URL. Right, and press enter, and then it comes back with the result. Right, so it looks just like normal RPC. All right, if I give it another URL, we get a different result. Um, and then if I give it a URL it's never seen before, we get zero, just like you'd expect. Okay. So that's, uh, that's DRBC. Okay. So now I want to talk about um, how to storm Guarantee data processing. So I said in the beginning that um, we were getting rid of those intermediate message brokers, so we needed a, a new strategy to guarantee data processing. Um, so now I'll show kind of how this works in Storm. Um, so the first thing you have to uh, decide is what does it mean to guarantee data processing? Okay, so the so idea here is that, okay, let's start by just looking at what happens, what happens during processing, during these real-time processing. We have your spout, which emits a tumble, right? And then that tumble goes to some set of bolts, and then they emit tuples based on that spout tuple, right? And then those tuples go to other bolts, and they <laughs> emit tuples based on those tuples. Those tuples go to other bolts, and, and, and so on. You end up with just kind of tree of messages, all triggered from that original spout tuple. Um, so Storm calls this the, the tuple tree, right? So examples here. So this is for the word count, uh, the streaming word count examples. So you have a, a sentence emitted, which is your spout tuple, and then you have these words emitted based on that spout tuple, and then you have the word counts emitted based on the word tuples. Um, now Storm says that a spout tuple is not considered processed until the entire tuple tree has been exhausted and every individual tuple in the tree has been marked as completed. Um, now if the tuple tree is not completed within some timeout, and this timeout defaults to 30 seconds, then the spout tuple is considered failed and will be replayed from the source. Um, now, there's a little bit of work you have to do to take advantage of this reliability guarantee. Um, but it's pretty straightforward. So there's two things you have to do. The first is you have to tell Storm whenever you're creating an edge in that tumble tree. Um, so here, here's, here's an implementation of the word splitter in Java. Um, so here it you know, splits the sentence on white space and then it emits the words. And you can see for every word it emits, it puts that original sentence tuple as the first argument. So this is called anchoring, and this just creates a new edge in the tuple tree between the new word tuple and then the, the, the old sentence tuple. And finally, when you're done processing a tuple, you act the tuple, and that just marks that one node is complete. And a storm does the rest of actually tracking the tuple tree and determining when it's the time to act or fail the spout tuple on the source. Where does the collector come from? The collector was... Um, um, The prepare method is the short answer. Yeah, so bolts have this prepare method, which is called before they start processing, and that's where you get your collector. It's where you admit tuples and where you do hack on and stuff. Okay, so that's like setting the collectors in the part of the build process. Correct. Yeah. Sorry, who's, who's is, talking? Is it or is it not? Sorry. Thanks. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so I just heard this like, voice. I'm just curious if, if the collector is something that you interact with directly, if it's more of an infrastructure, infrastructure kind of thing? It's, it's part of the, the API, so this is what. Whenever you need to emit tuples or access, is what you interact with. Okay. So in that example, um, the word count example, the count um, bolt, how does it know to disregard um, tuples sent by by something that's being replayed? So great question, and my next set of slides is about that. Um, I know I was one step ahead of that. Um, right. Actually, it's in two slides. Um, okay, so one more thing on the tuple tree stuff. So you might be wondering, like, isn't it pretty expensive to track these tuple trees? Like, what, what if you have, like, massive tuple trees, right? Like, aren't you going to use up a lot of memory, and, like, aren't you going to run into issues that way? 
Um, so, so kind of one of the keys to Storm um, is that the algorithm for tracking tumble trees is actually super efficient. Um, it actually just uses a constant amount of space to track every spell tumble, regardless of how many pending tuples there are. So you could have a billion pending tuples, and it'll still just use about 20 bytes of space to track the whole tree. Um, it's actually a really cool algorithm. Um, it's all documented on the wiki if you're curious. Um, this is the key to why Storm is able to use the strategy, get rid of those intermediate brokers, um, and still guarantee processing. Okay, so the next thing I want to talk about is um, something relatively new in Storm um, called transactional topologies. Um, so, I, you know, the most common question I used to get is, all right, uh, all right, so you have this at least once delivery guarantee. How do you do something like counting idempotently, giving, given an at least once guarantee? Right, this is the question you just asked. Um, so the answer to this in Storm is called transactional topologies. Uh, so the cool thing about transactional topologies is it's, it's not really a feature of Storm. It's actually a higher level abstraction built on top of Storm's primitives of streams, spouts, and bolts. And what transactional topologies allow you to do is get fully fault tolerant exactly once messaging semantics. Um, so it's not exactly once processing because ultimately if you have a failure you have to replay something. Um, but on top of the at least once guarantee, you can build exactly once semantics. So build your application in a way such that even though it's replaying, it was like you only processed it once. Okay, so, so the, the um, like I said, it's a higher level abstraction and, and the way you kind of do the computation is a little bit different. Um, so rather than process one tuple at a time, with transactional topologies, you process small batches of tuples at a time. Um, and if any part of a batch failed, you replay the whole batch. Kind of treat the batch as its own atomic unit. Um, now there's two phases to processing a batch. You process a batch, and when you finish processing, then you commit the batch. Um, and any number of bolts in your topology can participate in this commit phase. Um, now, what transactional the key thing that transactional topologies provide is that your commits are ordered. Um, if there's Ever, if, if there's a failure during a commit, it'll, it'll replay that commit, um, but, but, but once, um, it'll never go back and like commit some, some, some previous batch um, that it committed before. Right? So for example, um, let's say you go to commit batch one and that fails, well you'll retry the commit. Um, let's say that succeeds, now we'll move on to, to committing batch two. Um, let's say that succeeds, it does batch three, commits that. Then batch four fails commit, it replays that, and so on. So it's strongly ordered, but possibly with repeats, um, due to failures and due to retries. Um, so it turns out that this strong ordering, that's the key thing you need to get exactly once semantics, even in the case of failures. So like, let me show you an example of how you would do idempotent counting with this primitive of strong ordering. Um, so here I have this idempotent counting bolt. Um, so this is similar to that partial uniquer bolt I showed before because it has this like batch API uh, for doing the processing. So the idea here is that um, right, we get a new instance of this bolt for every, uh, for every <coughs> batch we're processing. Um, and the batch has this ID, which is the transaction attempt. And we'll use that in a second. Um, now during the processing phase, what you do is you aggregate in memory a partial Right, so the, the thing that you're going to use to commit to the database later. Um, now you can look up here, it has this, um, it implements that I committer marker interface, and this causes this bolt to participate in the commit phase, and what that means is that you have this guarantee that the finished batch method is going to be strongly ordered with commits. Okay? Now, given that, what you do to update the count is you get the value, let's say the current value from the database, um, but rather than store just the count in the database, you store a count and the transaction ID, the last transaction ID that was processed. Um, the idea is that when you go to update the count, you first check the transaction ID. If the transaction ID is equal to the transaction ID of the batch you're currently processing, then you skip the update. Don't update the database. Otherwise, you go ahead and increment the count by your partial count and update the transaction ID. Right? Now, because the commits are strongly ordered, um, this is actually idempotent counting, and it's exactly <coughs> it's like you were doing exactly once processing. Uh, 
Um, does that make sense to everyone? No? I mean, uh, you said the match would retry, but yes. then you said that if if the IDs are the same, they won't do anything. Correct. So, okay, so, so let's, let's like, if the first one failed, that's could that be the wrong count? Why, why, how would you get it to fail and yet have the right? So let's like let me give you an example. So let's say you're doing you're processing the batches. Five minutes. Okay. Let's say you're processing the batches. Um, let's say you go to process, let's say batch four, right? And it goes and you have, let's say, six different tasks updating counts in the database. Let's say three of them succeed, so they will have updated the, the transaction ID, but three of them fail. Okay? So you actually have to replay the whole batch from scratch. So you go to replay, and then those three tasks, so you have three tasks that succeeded the last time and three tasks that failed. So the three, ta ta the three tasks that already succeeded will look in the database and see oh, the transaction ID is the same as what I did last time because the, because the commits were ordered. So it does nothing. But the other three that failed were like, oh, it's different. So I, I've never actually, this data has never made it to the database, so they do the update. Right? And so it's that strong order in which lets you use that logic. Okay. Um, and just, just want to give a shout out. Um, I got the idea for this trick of storing the transaction ID from the Kafka developers. Very clever trick, and I think Storm takes this idea to its logical conclusion. Um, so one of the cool things about transactional topologies is that you can still process multiple batches in parallel, um, but your commits are ordered. So like while you're committing batch one, you can still be doing your processing phase for batches two through ten. So like doing those partial counts. Um, so this enables you to kind of maximize um, the resource utilization of your cluster. Um, one thing about transactional topologies, it actually requires a more sophisticated source than something like Kestrel or RabbitMQ. Um, but it turns out Kafka is actually um, has the perfect semantics for doing this. Um, and there's a project called Storm Contrib, which has a transactional spout implementation for Kafka. So just a few more tidbits about Storm. Um, Storm has a UI uh, similar to the Hadoop UI. Uh, this lets you see what's running on the cluster, and then it gives you detailed statistics about what's running. So it gives you things like latencies for the processing of each step, what's the throughput through every task, and things like that. Um, if you're on EC2, there's a companion project called Storm Deploy, which is a one-click deploy tool to provision, configure, install, and launch uh, an entire Storm cluster. Um, all the code I showed in this presentation is in the Storm Starter project. So this just contains some example code so that you can get up and running um, and learning very quickly. Finally, Storm has a lot of documentation on its wiki. Um, has, I think, over 20,000 words of documentation. Um, so I've gotten a lot of good feedback about that. Um, I think it really helps people get, get started. Um, okay, one more thing. It has uh, kind of, Storm has a growing ecosystem. So a lot of people have been open sourcing various spout implementations, uh, adapters to use Storm with other languages, and um, like bolts to make it easier to integrate with things like Cassandra and MongoDB. Uh, so I'll take a couple questions. Hey, you talked about the tuple tree in terms of uh, message retransmission. Yeah. And you talk about how efficient you can track the system. But I'm wondering, uh, in case of a failure, is there any uh, thought in the future to just retransmit the node that was lost? Because retransmission of the entire tuple tree could be uh, more expensive. Yeah. If, uh, if um, you're looking at like, yeah. like high throughput scenarios. Yeah. So retransmitting just the last node might be more efficient than transmitting yeah. a tuple tree. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. So obviously that, that would be desirable, right? Um, if someone ever provides me a, a way to do that, then how do we implement that? I don't, I don't know any reasonable way to do that. I mean, to kind of process from, to start transmitting from the middle, it kind of implies that you need to store all the intermediate messages, right. um, which is why you, do, you do not want to do that. It adds so much complexity and, and cost. Um, so the strategy Storm uses instead is is just always replaying the source and find it to be much simpler. Go ahead. So uh, all the replaying sort of you assume that you can replay a message from the source. Correct. So it's like an external web service or something. You, correct. You so might the, not so be able to correct the replay. Right, right, exactly. So like the replay logic depends on your on your source, right? So if if you're doing something like if your spout's like connecting directly to let's say the Twitter streaming API. Well, something like that won't be able to replay, right? But if you're using something like Kafka or Kestrel or RevenQ as your source, those sources can, can do the replay.
Any other questions? I think that's okay. Well, I'll be around afterwards. So thank you guys very much.